going to take a moment. Um, my name is Nancy Bowler, and I'm hosting uh, this afternoon for Amatana Sati, um, who is in Hawaii, and it's 9 a.m. where Ama is. Um, so just to share um, a little bit about Amatana Sati, um, I'm going to just read directly from the bio that uh, Ama Tanasati gave us. So Ama first encountered the Dharma in 1979. As a former Buddhist nun of 26 years, she combines the precision and rigor of Ajahn Chah forest tradition, compassion, pure awareness practices, and a passion for wholeness, Ama is in touch with the natural world and uses nature in her teaching. Ama has been teaching intensive meditation retreats in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia since 1995. Ama's teaching style emphasizes deep listening, authenticity, inquiry, fierce compassion, warmth, humor, and an unwavering commitment to presence. She feels a special calling to do her own work so that students from diverse communities feel supported and belonging. Where the community members are able to connect across differences of culture, race, gender, sexuality, and ability. She invites an openness to pause and inquire into the truth of the present moment integrating adaptive skillful means and rooted traditional approaches. And please keep in mind that Common Ground offers all programs freely and in the spirit of generosity. So we're so happy to have you this afternoon. Ama. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you everyone at Common Ground for welcoming me. And I just want to give a little context. Um, what I'm going to do this morning is uh, we're going to begin with a 20-minute meditation, and then I'll offer a talk. And during the talk, I will lead a guided meditation. And then afterwards, we'll have a time for questions or comments about um, either the talk or the guided meditation. So I would like to let me just get my timer here. I have to set a timer. Um, and I will ring us in and ring us out for the 20 minute silent meditation.
So good morning, everyone. And I'm here in Hawaii, and it would delight me if you're able to hear the little bird sound in the background in the garden. I don't know if they're coming through the speakers. Um, this is part two of a talk I gave a couple of uh, weeks ago on Sunday morning. The first part of the talk was on an overview of the foundations of mindfulness. And this talk is going to be attachment disturbances for meditators and looping around as to how the foundations of mindfulness can support us in that repair. And I'm very grateful to be here, grateful to talk. This topic is dear to my heart and happy to share it about, about it. I want to begin with a poem. Simply trust. Don't the petals flutter down just like that. It's a poem by Isa. And I love this poem because it speaks to the contrast between the reality that so many experience the world and the possibility of living with an effortless effort and a profound trust in the natural order of things. So when I first started meditating, I remember it really vividly. I was in a class in the University of California of Santa Cruz, sitting on the edge of my chair, exhilarated. I was listening to Jack Engler tell stories of meditation masters that he knew. He was describing their levels of peace and joy and love that seemed really out of reach. It seemed not humanly possible. Yet he was sharing stories about real people and things that he had directly witnessed himself. And I remember being riveted, gripped. And I knew then, at the age of 17, that I wanted to give my life to the pursuit of freedom. And a month later, I had a vision of being a nun. And that vision, combined with my passion for truth, propelled me into Buddhist monastic life for the 26 years that Nancy spoke about and a few years before that of being a postulate. So just hearing me say this, just pause for a moment and reflect on the first time you were introduced to meditation and the impact that it had on you. And now, the impact that it has on you today. Can you connect with your longing for freedom? The aspiration to move out of suffering and to find a peaceful, free way of being? And one of the things as we pause and we recollect is that what we can remember is that, or recognize, is that that longing for freedom, that longing for peace, that longing for the ending or the easing or the relief of suffering is something that living beings everywhere have. They don't necessarily have the same tools or the same way of speaking about it but it's a common hunger, longing, being sentient, alive. So when we put this together with the foundations of mindfulness, the Buddha said that this meditation, this collection of meditations and teachings in the four foundations of mindfulness is deliberately designed to reduce or completely eliminate sorrow and distress. And yet, how many of us have been practicing? I've been practicing for decades. I'm imagining others here have been practicing for a while. And yet, when I look at my own experience after all of these years, I am not completely free of distress. 
check in and see if that's also the case for you. So there are many possible reasons for this. And what I want to talk about today in looking at attachment disturbances is, is a one possible reason why this is happening. And it's very rarely talked about. So when I look at my own personal history, I can see that from the time I was a young teenager, I poured myself into meditation and it was really the center of my life. And from the very beginning, I was confident that it would be everything that I needed. And looking back, I can see that while it's true that meditation offered me invaluable tools and insights, it's also true that what I can see now is, is that I was unconsciously hoping to use the liberation that meditation promises in order to resolve pain that it is not designed to resolve. So meditation definitely gave me tools to manage patterns I experienced. I had more understanding of the importance of ethics. I was able to make wiser choices, the consequence of which was that I suffered less and that generally I had more well-being. But what I also noticed is that when the profound insights or profound experience of love or pure awareness would fade, my core sense of basic badness would return. And I have learned over these years that when our core beliefs about ourselves or the world are coming from attachment disturbances, they're not easy to shift. And so, when we're dealing with the resilience of attachment patterns, our capacity to fulfill the promise of meditation and eliminate sorrow, pain, and distress is limited. So in my own personal experience, I noticed that meditation didn't shift these basic core beliefs. And I am a realist rather than an idealist or a traditionalist and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. So in addition to the deep practices and study of meditation, I explored alternative philosophies and therapies and practices that would help. And one of the things that I have learned about over these last 12, 15 years is attachment theory. And more recently, I found and embarked on an attachment repair process. And this has helped me shift. And what I've noticed is, is that that basic belief of badness is no longer the place that I return to. So I wanted to talk about my own personal experience as a way of speaking a little bit more about the components of attachment disturbance and the consequences that are relevant for meditators and speak briefly about a meditation-based protocol that can be used to repair. And when I talk about the attachment repair, I'll loop together how this repair is connected to the foundations of mindfulness that I spoke about in the earlier talk. But before I launch into attachment repair, I want to just pause because I want to look at the word attachment. The Buddhist view of attachment is that it's the unhealthy grasping of desire, anger, or views. And when we're looking at this kind of attachment and we're looking at the Buddhist philosophy, we can see that attachment is the source of suffering. We want to get rid of this kind of attachment or reduce it, minimize it. But psychological attachment is the bonding that forms between caregivers and child. Without care, we wouldn't survive. And this kind of attachment is fundamental to well-being. We want this kind of attachment. 
So we have the same word and it has very different meanings. So when I talk about attachment disturbance, I'm talking about the disturbance related to the kind of attachment with our caregivers. When we look at the research, we can see that particularly during the formative attachment years, which is the first two years of one's life, exposing a child to different conditions will develop a secure attachment. There are five conditions. The first one is safety and protection. The second is attunement. The third is emotional soothing. The fourth is delight in their essence. And the fifth is encouragement to explore and develop. And these qualities lead to the child feeling one, secure, two, seen and known, three, soothed and comforted, four, valued in their essence, and five, confident in exploring the world and who they are uniquely. So when we received good enough caregiving, we learned to rely on our caregivers. We learned that we will, they will support us making sense out of the world. We learned what co-regulation and relaxation, balance and safety feel like. And having all of these things is a very significant part of being securely attached. And some of the signs of being securely attached are that we have confidence that we will be seen, we will be understood, and that there are people to make sense out of and be able to manage the inevitable challenges of life. And what this leads to is being creative and being able to imagine our own future and explore the world. We are able to discover and assert who we are uniquely. And with these kinds of different forms of trust and confidences, we're not in a constant state of stress. So just pause. That's a lot of information. Just notice where it lands. Notice how your own mind might be starting to consider what your childhood was like and what your patterning was like and what kinds of stress you live with regularly. So when we look at the other side, when we look at what happens when we didn't receive good enough care, it means that the above set of needs were not met. 20 to 30 percent of the time. So we're not talking about perfect parenting or caregiving. Good enough really isn't a very high standard in terms of percentages, but what good enough means is, is that it means if it wasn't good enough, it means that ruptures were often not acknowledged or repaired. And it could also possibly mean that caregivers caused harm. So when a child is reliant upon someone who is unreliable, someone who dismisses their feelings, rejects, or abandons them, when a child's safety is dependent on someone who harms them, they find ways of compensating. These compensations are what leads to insecure attachment strategies. And in a child, they have different names anxious avoidant attachment, anxious ambivalent attachment, or disorganized attachment. And these three different kinds of insecure attachment strategies are all signs of attachment disturbances. So one of the things that's really important to recognize is that these insecure attachment styles help us make sense out of what's going on and to help us stay safe. So when we understand this, it helps us appreciate how adaptive our survival mechanisms are. But when we start to understand attachment, it's important as meditators for a few reasons. When we learn how our behaviors, relationships, and core beliefs have so much to do with our early attachment patterns, and how resilient they are, resistant to change they are, 
it can help us understand one possible reason or explanation why the Buddha's promise of his practice leading to full liberation and still many of us are still struggling or suffering or dealing with some basic forms of core beliefs that don't serve us. So I see there's a question in the chat. So the question to a chat. So um, what might be helpful because it's going to be a, maybe a little bit distracting for me to deal with chats in the middle of the talk is to hold your questions and we'll be have a time afterwards. So the other thing is, is that as meditators, we are reliant upon being able to perceive what is going on in the present moment. It's important to understand there are three ways that attachment disturbances change what we're able to know. According to the work of Stephen Terrell and Kathy Kane, these differences include becoming extra alert to signals of danger and missing neutral or positive feelings living in what they describe as a faux window of tolerance, looking like we are calm, but actually we are not, we're anxious. And interception is impacted, which means that we cannot feel and interpret correctly what is going on. Becoming extra alert means that our systems are hyper aroused and we are not able to notice the neutral and positive feelings. And because we can't notice them, we're missing opportunities to feel calmer. Actually being calm rather than appearing calm is important in how we are able to manage our internal state. When we cannot feel or interpret correctly what's going on, both of which are essential in meditation, we have reduced our capacity to make meditative tools effective. When we're living in a faux window of tolerance, it means that we do not employ methods to calm ourselves because we don't think that we need them. And our meditation teachers or our therapists may not notice either. So when we routinely miss neutral or positive feelings and live in a faux window of tolerance, stress builds. As the stress builds, our physiology changes. Cortisol levels increase, in our blood pressure and our heart rate increase, our breathing becomes more rapid and shallow. The, oxygenation levels change the way our body operates. We can experience more inflammation, more pain, and a whole variety of health issues happen as a result of that. Our physiology changes our mind states, and the more stress we experience, the more we are primed to look for and see danger, think the worst is going to happen, feel anxious, angry, out of control, and overwhelmed. And this definitely contributes to feeling unsafe. So let's just pause for just a moment. Because how many of us are feeling overwhelmed and stressed and unsafe these days? And many of us are looking outside as to what all the external conditions are. And it's not an unreasonable thing to do that. But this helps point us in the direction of what might be contributing internally that is giving rise to that experience. So when our physiology drives what we see and do in our world and how we feel about what's going on in the world. So when we begin to understand some of the far-ranging impacts of attachment disturbances, it can motivate us to find ways to repair the disturbance and then return to healthy functioning. So I want to introduce an attachment repair 
process. There is an attachment repair process that was formulated by uh, Dan P. Brown and David Elliott. It's called the Three Pillars Approach. And it consists of restructuring the internal working model of attachment using idealized parent figures. The second pillar is enhanced metacognition or the ability to use the mind to analyze experience. And the third is enhancing our collaborative abilities. Initially, let me just focus on the second pillar because the second pillar of enhancing metacognition is directly connected to the talk that I gave before on the four foundations of mindfulness. Mentalization or metacognition is learning how to differentiate between our perceived experience and what is actually happening. And this is where the foundations of mindfulness come back into the picture. If we are upset, if we feel sad, and we shift from the thoughts and the feelings to the body sensations that underpin the sad feeling, when we move to observe the body sensations, it is a little bit easier to stay present without getting caught into the cascade of thoughts and associations related to the sadness. When we don't do that, and when we follow a whirlwind of associations and thoughts, it can lead to further states of powerlessness or sadness or feelings of despair. So in this example, the sadness is what's actually happening. The despair or feelings of powerlessness that come from the associations of it are the way that we're relating to the sadness. So in this example, getting caught in a whirlwind of thoughts about all the reasons why we feel sad can undermine our ability to respond in a wise and a compassionate way to the sadness directly. So I want to pause here and offer a guided meditation. This material is a little bit dense and a little bit different than a regular Dharma talk in that it's, it's um, heavy on the information load. So I just want to pause and invite us into a meditation posture. And before you close your eyes, I just would like to invite you to just look over your shoulder and look around the room and look over your other shoulder. And now this time as you're looking in your space, I want to invite you to notice the absence of danger. Notice the absence of scary things, of scary people, of scary smells. But in your immediate visual field, there is an absence of danger. And as you notice the absence of danger, notice what happens to the level of tension in your body, the level of tension in your nervous system. And then when you're facing forward again, looking above the screen, just allowing your eyes to rest on something that's comforting. Just for a moment, take in that comfort. Just let it fill you up. And as you just take in a moment and let comfort fill you up, if you feel at ease, I invite you to allow your eyes to close. And just notice your body sitting here. Notice your weight, notice the space you occupy, notice the contact with the floor and the contact with the cushion. There might be a breeze from a fan. There might be sounds around you. 
Just notice your experience sitting here. And there's nothing that you need to do or fix or change or get rid of or make better. But just shifting into a open, non-judgmental, welcoming awareness of what's here, what's present, sitting with you right now. And it may be that one of the things that you notice while you're sitting is that you're breathing. And if the breath is a comforting anchor for you to allow your attention to rest, then I invite you to allow your attention to settle with the breath. No need to control the breath or change the breath, but just receive the in-breath. and the out-breath. And you may notice that the more you are able just to settle with the breath, the less the thoughts and ideas and plans about what happens next intrude and grab your attention so that the focus is connected to settling. And we can also notice that when our attention is grabbed, we can just gently reconnect with the breath. So there's a no need for a judgment or even an opinion, just noticing and reconnecting with the breath. Now I'd like to invite you to just scan and see if there's any uh, feelings or emotions that you can detect, whether there's a little bit of anxiety or some fear present or whether you're feeling sad. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're feeling a little depressed or frustrated. And again, without needing to have an opinion or a judgment about what you're experiencing, just see if you can notice it. And notice the texture. Notice what it feels like in your body. Notice if it's big or small, if it has movement connected to it. And as you stay with the feeling, and it also might be that you don't notice any feeling. And if that's the case for you, then just stay with the breath. Or there might be a sense of numbness, and numbness is also something that you can feel or a sense of emptiness, and that's also something that you can focus on. So when you connect with what's present emotionally, just stay with it for a few breaths. And it might be that you notice that when you stay with it, then uh, there's not that long a time and 
And then there's associations of where this is coming from and why it's there and other things that remind you of it. And we can notice that when we follow those thoughts and believe those thoughts, that it has an impact on the original feeling. When I do that, often the original feeling gets bigger and then it changes and morphs to other feelings. And often the other feelings are also activating But if we come back to the feeling, sadness, anger, emptiness, numbness, grief, frustration, whatever the feeling is, come back to the feeling. And when we notice that there's a a movement towards associative thoughts, we shift our frame of reference and look at the body sensation. Just notice the place in our body where we are experiencing the correlate of that emotion. It might be tightness, it might be heat, it might be feeling of moving energy, it might be coldness, it might be physical discomfort. And as we focus our attention on the physical experience, It might be that we notice that it's easier to be with that. It's less likely that we're going to be hijacked into associative thoughts and ideas that escalate the emotions. So this ability to shift the frame of reference from the emotion back to the body sensation really helps us stay connected to what's happening without being taken up or taken away or hijacked by uh, associative thoughts, feelings, and emotions connected with the initial feeling. So there's the first feeling, and then how we relate to it. And we can see that how we relate to it is going to impact what happens next. So now come back to the body sitting here and again feeling your weight, feeling the contact with the floor and the contact with the chair, feeling the space you occupy and notice the quality of settledness or unsettledness that's present for you. And is it different or is it the same as when you started? And again, opening your eyes and opening them above the screen. And again, just looking around the room over your shoulders. Noticing what's the same and what's different. So this is meditation and this ability in meditation to be able to shift our frame of reference really helps us with the process of mentalization. Mentalization for someone who is securely attached is hugely faster and more accurate than for someone who has an attachment disturbance. As mentalization increases in accuracy and in speed, 
we're able to know what we're feeling and sensing and making sense out of what happens internally as well as in relationship with others. This then makes it easier for us to know when we need to soothe ourselves and to be effective in soothing ourselves. It also means that the many different tools that meditation offers will be able to use more effectively. But it also means that the more that we're able to do this, the more we're able to communicate what's going on in our experience with someone else. And to notice what's going on for somebody else and to be able to sort things out, resolve differences of perception and repair ruptures. So this then becomes a really important ingredient in healthy relationships. So when we come back to attachment, statistically a majority of children worldwide have good enough caregivers and are securely attached. And yet, if you were one of the insecurely attached children, then you can imagine ideal parents providing you with just exactly the right attunement, encouragement that you need. And since the mind is really unable to notice the difference between what you imagine and what is real, over time, and doing this many times, this can impact your internal working model of attachment. And then eventually what this leads to is noticing when you feel unsafe, being able to imagine what you need to soothe yourself, and experiencing that feeling of soothing. And then as you experience more safety, your stress levels decrease. And as your stress levels decrease, there's more a capacity to connect with your innate basic goodness. And from that, make choices and live from that place. The third pillar is the support from collaboration. This comes from support of the, of the idealized parent figure coach or therapist. It can also come from nature or peers or sangha that understand how to cultivate this kind of trust and make space for these kinds of inquiry. And this is one of the places that I feel really energized and excited to cultivate and to develop. Which happy to talk about more later. So when we step back for just a moment and look at the spectrum of human development, we can see that, you know, we're born, we grow, and that at some point we die. And we know this is certain. What we don't know is in what ways we're going to grow and how and when we're going to die. So when we're born, we're completely unequipped to take care of ourselves. We're dependent on the care of those around us for our basic needs. And the fact that all of us are here and able to be on Zoom is an indication that an awful lot of our basic needs did get met because if they wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to be here doing this. Because our psychological development has a lot to do with how those needs were met and how we were able to deal with interruptions of our needs, and since part of our needs are physical, our psychological development can never be completely separated from our physical experience. Spiritually, we can grow in different ways. And over years of meditation and years of contact with the Dhamma and years of teaching and years of being connected to a spiritual community, we can see that there's gradual shifts that happen over time. We can grow in our ethical capacity to live. We can grow in our capacity to be generous. 
We can grow in our increasing skill with our thoughts and feelings and how we experience them in ourselves and the way that we respond to thoughts and feelings in others. And all of these things can be connected to our capacity to soothe ourselves and manage emotions that are difficult. It can increase our ability for kindness and for joy, our resiliency. And we can gradually shift from knowing ourselves through facts and characteristics of identity to having more access to the qualities of awareness, compassion, joy, that really are essential qualities of who we are. But in addition to this gradual process, there's also spiritual qualities we can discover that because they are always there, they don't necessarily develop over time. And when we experience them, they can radically shift our relationship with what's going on. Sometimes these radical shifts are preceded by a dark night of the soul where we feel a lot of fear. And when we have an attachment disturbance, this dark night of the soul, which precedes something transformational, triggers our abandonment fear. Because this fear is connected to unmet needs at a very young age, it becomes overwhelming. And the only way that we usually deal with it is to pull back from it. Rather than going through it, the fear to experience the emptiness or the non-dual state that doesn't have any sense of separate, solid existence, we move away from it. So one of the reasons why dealing with attachment disturbance is so important for meditators is that we remove a significant obstacle to realizing and stabilizing the non-dual states of mind that lead to radical freedom. So no matter how important meditation is, it will not just by itself shift our attachment patterns. Since our attachment patterns has a lot to do with how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive the world, and how much of the fruits of meditation we are able to realize, then it seems to me, <laughs> at least it's in my idea, that understanding this and then changing it from an insecure to an earned secure attachment style is going to be very important, not only on our personal life, but on our meditative life. This is certainly has been my own personal experience. So I have uh, two colleagues and it is our intention to create a relational based idealized parent figure protocol using the foundations of mindfulness as one of the pillars of the regard of the repair. And I am interested in this because I can see that there are many, many, many benefits in meditation. But unless we do this work, there's an obstacle that it's very difficult for meditation to help us get through. And this obstacle not only is connected to our ability to realize the fruits of meditation, but it's also connected to the ways traumas nest and how we can repair them and heal from them. So I want to pause now and open up to comments, to questions, to impact, to how this, how this landed for you. So please either raise your hand. Uh, okay, so Barbara. Hi, well, this was fantastic. And I'll, I'll tell you why for me is that um, 
I have been working with an autonomic nervous system therapist for three years to address what you're talking about. Um, she's a trauma therapist too. And then about three weeks ago, I found common ground. Um, and so I started coming to a lot of, of the programs and doing meditation every day. So I'm just a baby on that. But I kept coming back to this question of, I didn't understand how, I just felt like there was a gap for me that the autonomic nervous system and trauma wasn't being addressed. And like I said, I've been here three weeks. <laughs> so that, that's my frame of reference. So this just seems like it fills in one of the spaces that I was searching for. So Barbara, I'm gladdened to hear that there's a resonance. And I can say I've been in meditation circles for 40 years, and I also noticed that trauma was not addressed. So being a baby or being in for decades, it you I was at the same conclusion. Trauma is not addressed in the meditation centers or circles or monasteries at a level that that was effective for me on any way. It was often, it was actually never even mentioned usually. You know, so we're in the same soup, even though we're coming from different experiences of our how much meditation that we've done. But because I have experiences with various different kinds of traumas and wasn't able to use meditation exclusively to resolve them, then it became something important for me to understand and to be able to navigate and to release. And that's the reason why I have so much passion for this topic. Because if the point of meditation is to reduce stress and sorrow and suffering, and yet meditation doesn't deal with the stress, sorrow, and suffering that's in these particular areas, then there is a gap between the promise and the result. And we've got to figure it out so that we can, we've got to figure it out. And people have been talking about attachment for decades, but there's very few people who are actually talking about attachment repair. And that what is exciting to me about this protocol. This is a, a protocol that actually addresses how to shift your attachment pattern to an earned secure formation and repair. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really exciting. So when I say this, Barbara, what happens for you? Well, I just am excited. I mean, when you were doing the guided meditation and you were coming up with words of how people were feeling, you know, I, I don't have, haven't been experiencing um, joy and happiness and those, the good juicy feelings that you want. And, and, and you were mentioning, you know, you might be feeling grief, you might be feeling blah, blah, blah. I was actually feeling so much excitement and energy that this was being addressed that I just, I mean, I guess you're not supposed to grasp, but I was like, it was just wonderful because I was feeling happy and excited. So we also have to understand that the teaching on grasping are also contextual. You know, when you're in a flood and you have a raft, then it's really important to grasp as hard as you can onto that raft. You've got to, because if you don't, you're going to drown. And so the teachings on attachment and when you grasp and when you don't grasp are contextual. And when there's something that really speaks to you as a vehicle for a way out of a river of suffering, then it's important to pay attention to that and to do what you can in order to optimize the benefits of that. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Anyone else? Comments, questions, impact? Yes, Scott, please. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for doing this talk today. Um, I have a question. What if you had one parent that was very nurturing and there in all the right ways, but also had a parent who wasn't? Uh, my brother and I both um, had a relationship with our dad that was 
well, he, it's not that he was totally absent. He wanted the best outcome for, for us, but he didn't know how to be involved with us himself. Uh, and so we both came away from that with some, some uh, trauma, you know, self-esteem. Um, I think we both compensated in our own ways. Um, but I'm just wondering if you had one parent that was quite uh, sufficient, if that makes a difference. So certainly the nourishment that we get does make a difference. But, you know, there's so many compounding factors that it really isn't an easy way to, uh, like just as a, a person from this perspective to be able to say. So the, my, uh, my coach, my IPF coach, makes it a criteria that when he works with his clients, he asks them all to get an AAI test, an adult assessment interview test, which is an hour long process of asking you a bunch of questions and then they score it. And that gives you a clear read of where you're at because there's so many different factors involved, you know, different people, different extended families, the kinds of stuff that you're carrying epigenetically, what got activated. I mean, there's just so many things that it's not possible to be able to say in, in like a question like that, I can't answer it. But if you're interested in repair, then going through this test then gives you a read of where you're actually at and then that gives the coach clarity about how to support you so that you can actually repair. Thank you. So, Ama, I think Michelle H. has had her hand up. Okay, Michelle H., I don't see your hand. And so, please. It, it, it's a little I'm not seeing symbol oh, hand, is. but go I ahead see. and unmute, Michelle. I H. see it now, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm um, trying to be skillful in the words that I choose because there's so much that I'd like to share and I just really resonate with what everyone has said. And Ama, the path that you've been on, the length of it to come to this wisdom, I just really appreciate so much. Your brilliance, you're willing to share it. Um, I've been a meditator for about 10 years and I've until very recently, I felt like I wasn't really a Buddhist. I would kind of have that shame. Like I'm not, I'm not really a meditator and I am, I'm a practitioner. Um, and that nervous system story that you tell of the unraveling, that was definitely my life. Um, I've spent decades in talk therapy from a lot of developmental trauma and that had its place. Um, and the therapy line was then CODA 12 step, like Codependence Anonymous has hit a nerve. And over the last two years, somatic experiencing, working with a therapist, and I know you're gonna understand what I'm talking about. With my Western meditation practice, which I have appreciated enormously, there was this gap of the trauma and I struggled with that, didn't know what to do with it. There was also a gap in guiding me to spirituality, which ironically, the 12 step program made me face like that I was powerless and bringing it to a higher power. And so I started inviting my higher power onto the cushion and that was a piece. So anyway, I'll cut to the chase. I just got accepted to the two-year mindfulness teacher training program. So the fact that you're involved, I'm just thrilled. And I'm one year into a three-year somatic experiencing practitioner training um, and I just really want to be wise about how I go about practicing this. And I knew that I needed the mindfulness training so that I could do the SE work thoughtfully. And so I'm so curious what you might guide all of us, um, but me to do as I move in this direction. You're just so spot on. So um, I, the, the Awakening Truth newsletter that I just published has three blogs in it. And I'm going to put it in the chat and encourage you to cut and paste those links. One of them is for the newsletter and one of them is specifically for 
a sign up form if you're interested as the attachment repair process comes forward to sign up for that. Because my intuition is that what you're doing is excellent. And as we are rolling out this attachment repair process, that that might be something that would be very much up your alley in terms of giving you the, the fulcrum and the leverage to shift what needs to shift. I haven't known exactly what it is. And I know no one knows exactly what it is, but this is the closest I have felt to, ah, this is what I'm trying to pull together. And you're already way down the path. And so I so appreciate you and your journey and then just being here and giving this talk. And I will definitely follow up on those things. I just can't say thank you enough. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, Michelle, I'm grateful to hear this because as you might imagine, it's been a complex journey for me. And those three blogs, the first one called Confessions of an Avid Meditator speaks about nested traumas and my personal experience with them. And it's about as bland and as vanilla as you can get in terms of the actual reality of what I've actually lived through, you know? And so it's, you know, I, I've got the t-shirt. <laughs> I've read the book. <laughs> And what I feel grateful for is now I feel like I'm in a position to be able to start supporting others so that they can integrate and be able to move forward in their lives and then make good use of the meditation, which, I mean, I have loved meditation. Meditation has been a center part of my life for decades, you know, and it's just always been a mystery to me is how come these things which I have had direct experience with don't, I can't stabilize. You know, and it's also curious to me just how little this is spoken about, you know, in terms of meditation circles or in other spiritual communities. And it's just not talked about. And for me, it's pivotal. It's pivotal not only for our own health and well being, but it's also pivotal in as we understand attachment and the way that it functions our nervous system. It's also pivotal in our ability to look at and repair these nested and compounding traumas. Which has a lot to do with why so many people are feeling so, I mean, we're living in a world that has complexities and pressures and is out of control in a way that it hasn't been. But when we have on top of that, our own nervous system dysregulation we're looking at the outside to find safety. And one of the ways that we can address it is by seeing how we can get our internal nervous system to settle so that we can experience safety. And then from that, we can see what, our, what we can do in the world. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to just express my appreciation and gratitude again for being here and for Common Ground inviting me and for allowing me to give these two talks. The first one was on the foundations of mindfulness, and this one is the way in which the foundation of mindfulness can support us in our attachment repair. And um, just to invite you to stay connected and to sign up for this particular form if you're interested, as well as to sign up for the newsletter if you want to have more information about things that we're doing generally. And then I want to pass over to Nancy for the last few minutes of announcements. Thank you so much, Amma. So I don't know if um everyone is kind of feeling one thing is I'm really appreciative that we recorded this and that we could go back. It was such a, a dense talk. And so this will be available um, on the Common Ground website to listen to this again if you want to. Um, and if we just take a moment kind of feeling this just all of how it's possible to receive these teachings and that they're offered to us as a beautiful gift. And as was 
mentioned, I think by Michelle saying, like just feeling the, the years of um, experience that Ama brings here and the just wholeheartedness and giving. And then if you want to, you could support Ama Tanasati. You could um, go to the Common Ground website and maybe since it's in the chat here, I'll put it on there, that if you um, want to support Common Ground that, um, and AMA, that you could um, send a donation and um, support her. Um, when you do this, I'm just gonna put the link in here that it's gonna prompt you to ask if you want to give your donation to a specific teacher, and then you could put Amatanasati there. Um, just let me have a moment to put this in the chat area. So this is just a direct, a direct link if you um, wish to donate. Um, go. Otherwise, um, Nancy, can I ask you a question? Somebody yeah. was saying that they tried opening the link to the newsletter and they couldn't get it to work. Oh, if, okay. I, if I send you a copy of the newsletter, is there a way that you can make that available? To, like, can I, is there a place to electronically post it? Um, if the link isn't working i can talk to robin about that like what would be the best way of, of how to make that available okay now see let me check here that this was i just want i just need to experiment here um oh okay jessica just posted again that she got it okay um yeah i mean let me know if anyone else was having a problem with those links, but it would be nice to kind of resolve that here. Um, I think also in our weekly newsletter that they, they might have been there also, okay. but uh, we can double check on that. Good. Well, again, I appreciate your time and your attention and your presence. And I just hope that this work is something that supports a deep and profound resolution of all of these different layers so that all of us and all beings can know and experience a deep and profound sense of ease and well-being. Thank you. Deep gratitude. Thank you so much, Amma, for all that you share. Thank you. Thank you, Amma. Yeah, feel free to unmute if you want you. to share any sentiment. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Nancy, can you turn the recording off? I will.